Hey everyone, it's Brandon with FastDataScience.ai and today in this tutorial what I want to talk a little bit about is something that I think is really missing from a lot of the online education that's out there and available for aspiring data scientists or even established data scientists or, or established professionals trying to break into data science roles. Uh, and that is really making sure to emphasize an understanding of how all the technical skills that we're learning uh, really apply to the uh, business process or the enterprise process. Um, and so really kind of focusing on understanding the big picture. Uh, so today in, in this particular conversation, what I want to focus on is um, really understanding the data science pipeline. Uh, that is looking from a high level at all the different steps that a typical business would require uh, for any data science solution to be properly built and executed and deployed uh, so that it has the impact that is expected for that particular business problem. Uh, in my book, I talk uh, about a series of different steps um, that, uh, that I'll go over with you today. Obviously, there's a lot of different ways in which you can break up uh, the, the typical life cycle of a data science project. Um, but I look at it from the perspective of, you know, what are the things that I need to be aware of as a data scientist? What skills should I be aware of? Uh, don't necessarily need to be an expert in, but need to have some awareness so I know how to ask the right questions uh, in order to be successful in the implementation of my project, uh, particularly focusing that around the business context. So all of the things that typically go into setting up, um, you know, technical architectures within business and understanding how data science then applies to those technical architectures. Uh, and so, um, you know, what we're going to go through today is uh, my perspective on the typical data science pipeline. Another reason I want to cover this is it's also the first question that I ask whenever people interview uh, for open roles that I may be hiring for. And that's true at pretty much any data science level, whether you're a junior data scientist all the way up to a senior data scientist or even a manager of data science. Everybody has to have an understanding of the things that data scientists need to go through in order to build their solutions. Uh, it's really, really important for all of us to maintain that understanding uh, and to be able to communicate it to our business partners so they understand our timelines around actually executing on different data science solutions. So let's jump into it. Uh, in my book, I present this um, particular graphic, and what this does is it helps us kind of, um, you know, provide a framework for thinking about the different steps that a data scientist would go through on a typical data science project. Uh, and this is typical for most enterprises and, and especially small and medium businesses that don't necessarily have different roles for folks who are um, sort of more specialized in, say, data engineering or um, some other part of this process. Um, and, and nevertheless, even if they did, data scientists really should have some understanding of the skills required for each of these, even if they don't have to actually implement those skills. Um, they still need to be able to know how to ask the right questions, have informed conversations with those team members. Um, so I break it out into six different uh, steps. Um, that is to start with storage, then understand the concepts associated with access, uh, then also to build an understanding of the data that we're using or trying to use to build data science solutions with. Uh, then we quickly get into feature engineering, um, which is engineering that data so that it's prepped and ready for machine learning models to train with. Uh, then we get into the real data science-y stuff, uh, so machine learning, uh, that is training all of our uh, different candidate models to identify the best possible model or, or ensemble of models that may uh, provide us with the best, uh, the best prediction or the best classification, whatever the problem really entails. Uh, and then the final piece, which again is another piece that I often see um, a lot of online education uh, sort of um, ignoring or, or not really focusing very uh, heavily on, which is uh, making sure that we understand what's required to take all of the experimentation and research that happens to get you to that champion machine learning model that's going to be the solution uh, or part of the solution for a much bigger business problem and then productionizing that putting that into a uh, environment uh, with uh, proper controls and security and so forth uh, so that that model can uh, interact with other digital assets within a business, including things like other applications uh, or databases and so forth. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into what these different stages entail. And, and while it does look linear here, uh, in reality, um, there's often the case where, you know, we might start, you know, identifying different data stores, get access to those stores, only to go back and realize, oh, there's other stores that I need to actually grab to. So it's not truly a linear process. There's a lot of back and forth, uh, but we'll present it as such to build some understanding and a framework for uh, a high level understanding of, of what are the steps required for a typical data scientist working in a business context. Okay, so the first two, storage and access. Uh, so storage, really, um, the skills that are sort of uh, associated with this part of the process are obviously things related to data engineering, which really includes understanding databases, so different types of databases and data warehouse technology that's available. Uh, enterprises often use a technology called a relational database um, or a SQL database, um, and really that is probably the most familiar form of data storage, uh, particularly for data scientists, because often what we need to do is we need to engineer the data so that it looks very similar to the tables that we see in those relational databases. Um, so again, there's a, a, an easy translation there. Um, but it's important to understand there are other types of databases. There's NoSQL databases, for example, like document databases, um, MongoDB or uh, CosmoDB or, or others. There, there are quite a few. Uh, there are graph databases. Each different database technology may require a slightly different query language to be able to actually query and access that data so that you can pull it out of the database into your data science environment and build your solution around. So it's important to have some sense of that, where your data sources are coming from, what kind of technology is housing that data. It'll give you an indication of what kind of query language you need to know to be able to actually pull that data into your data science environment. Uh, SQL being one of the more common because of the relational databases, that structured query language, it's a very popular skill set uh, for data scientists to, to want to understand. Uh, and then also finally understanding how that data is organized. We call those data models, a little bit different term than what you would uh, talk about in the context of data science. Our models are, are statistical models. Data models within the context of databases are just the organization of that information. Uh, SQL databases or relational databases um, have often very intricate and sophisticated data models. Uh, NoSQL databases alternatively will have less sophisticated uh, data models perhaps because the data um, are uh, writable to those environments um, in ways that are, are different and more agile than what you might find in a relational database. Okay, so once you know where your data are and what technology is housing that data, uh, you need to get access. And it's important to have some sense of the kinds of things you need to know to be able to get access. Uh, so having some understanding of server architecture. So understanding that in order to access a database that's often being served on some server within uh, an enterprise technical architecture, uh, we need to know the IP address, for example, of that particular server. In addition, we also often need to know the, the port that is open for this kind of access from users to grab readable data out of those databases. So having some sense of that server architecture and then understanding all the security protocols that are layered on top of that to protect the data inside of it, uh, understanding the kinds of questions you need to ask of your security teams for getting access to that data uh, across the different servers that that data may be available in. Uh, and so understanding that uh, is really fundamental to ensuring uh, that you know uh, and are equipped with the right questions uh, so that you can quickly uh, identify the process that's in place to be able to access that information that you need to do your job. Okay, once we get through storage and, and access and we're able to actually access that data, we query it, we pull it into our data science environment, which could be another server, it could be on your local uh, laptop or machine, uh, then we want to understand that data. Uh, so understanding is a process um, that's also referred to as exploratory data analysis or EDA uh, and it's at this point that we start to get creative um, and we can use lots of different uh, tools and techniques to help us understand that data. The starting point is often descriptive statistics, just simply understanding what are the averages, what are the standard deviations, do we see any potential for outliers or lots of missing values. Um, all of those kind of very basic questions about data really help to give us some insight on understanding the potential information value that's inherent in that data. 
data visualizations are a fundamental tool at this part of the uh, at this part of the process um, and then for some more sophisticated uses you may have very large data sets that you want to sort of reduce the number of possible features uh, and so we start to maybe layer in some unsupervised analytics such as factor analysis to group those columns into indices or fewer columns so that we retain the information available uh, but also reduce the number of dimensions that we're training our machine learning models with helps with explainability also helps improve their generalizability uh, as well um, that starts to really bleed and overlap with feature engineering. Feature engineering is a really great place for data scientists to be really creative. Um, this is where you not only leverage your understanding of the data as it exists in its digital form, but you also can start to bring in an understanding of the particular domain that you're trying to solve this problem in. So for example, uh, it's often really useful, and I do this all the time, being that my background is actually in psychology, particularly social psychology and quantitative psychology. Um, I often think about how I can engineer the features available in a data set uh, to try and approximate um, some psychological constructs that may be informative in predicting uh, some outcome or some business problem uh, that I'm trying to train a machine learning model with. A uh, really great example of creative feature engineering comes from a really famous data set that a lot of students uh, learn to build some of their first models on, and that is the Titanic data set. In the Titanic data set, uh, you're offered uh, a table. Uh, that table has columns. One of the columns is your target column that you're trying to train a model with, and that is whether or not a particular passenger on the Titanic survived. So it's ones and zeros. I think it's one for survival, zero for non-survival. Uh, and then you have a series of other columns that are features. Um, those features also have other information embedded in them uh, that can be extracted as its own feature, as its own column, to help improve the prediction of the model that you build. So for example, one of the features in there has the passenger name. Uh, and in that passenger name, there is uh, a um, salutation for each passenger. Uh, so things, for example, I believe it's like Mr. or Mrs. Um, and some other salutations that upon further analysis and some domain understanding, you might recognize that those are indicative of a passenger status. So if you write some code to extract some information out of that column to create a new feature called status, Status, it turns out that for that Titanic problem, status is a very significant and important predictor of whether or not a particular passenger survived. So it's a great example of creative engineering, feature engineering, um, and it's a place where I think data scientists have a lot to learn, and I'll certainly be uh, tackling feature engineering more specifically in future tutorials as well. But let's move on with the process here. We're just looking at a high level. Um, the next stage is really what we more classically define as data science, and that is the machine learning sort of training phase. Um, and this is where you really want to have an understanding of the data science toolkit available to you. Um, the classical toolkit, which applies to most data science problems in most particularly small and medium sized businesses um, where maybe they don't have a ton of data uh, or where they're data are limited uh, in some way, shape, or form. Um, often a lot of those classic approaches to data science and machine learning, those algorithms that are either frequentist algorithms like regression um, or those kinds of, 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 of algorithms uh, or Bayesian where we're dealing with prior probabilities or some combination thereof, um, or maybe they're rule-based as in decision trees, right? All of these are different algorithms um, that come with that classic toolkit for, for machine learning. And so these are the kinds of concepts that are important to know at this point. Again, I don't need to tell all of you this. This is where you probably spend most of your time learning and training. Um, uh, and then there's also deep learning uh, frameworks, a little bit more advanced. Um, and we'll certainly be covering some deep learning frameworks. Uh, I will be talking about some of those and some of their applications uh, in, f in the future. Once we have trained our champion model, so we train a bunch of different types of models, we identify whether one or some combination of them uh, is going to provide us with the best possible prediction, the most generalizable prediction, uh, then the final step is to go through the code, uh, identify the different components that are required, for example, our data engineering component, right, where we develop all the features from the data, maybe we have a data extract component 
component first and then a data engineering component where we develop our features and pr prep the data so that it is ready to be scored on the champion model. Then we have our model that's also ready to do the scoring, so ingests that data and produces some, some predictions or some scores. Uh, and then we need to be able to essentially have some downstream means of ingesting that into the business. Um, and so the production process is really the the point at which you take your, all of your research efforts uh, and you put them into a product that allows for um, more DevOps type of um, uh, governance, essentially. So this is where you get the concepts of machine learning operations or ML ops. Um, and so it's important for data scientists to understand that it's at this point that we need to be concerned about things like scale, how much data are, is your pipeline going to be required to churn through? Is it significantly more than what it was trained on? At what frequency does it need to be uh, scored on? All of those things impact scale. Understanding that uh, there are different deployment uh, frameworks. So we can use APIs where we set up our models or our data engineering pipelines as APIs or web services so that other applications can call those services, maybe pass data to them so that then our services provide scores in response. And then finally, other uh, DevOps related concepts like code versioning, good coding practices, understanding the concepts of peer review and all those behaviors necessary uh, to ensure that our products um, are, are um, easy to update. We can quickly manage bug fixes. All of those kinds of things um, really are what are involved with the productionizing process. Um, and so that's the last piece of the data science life cycle or the data science pipeline. Uh, so having some sense of all these different skills really, really will go a long way to helping to support, um, you know, sort of how we think about the way in which data science applies to the bigger picture, the business picture. Uh, if this is something that you don't have a whole lot of experience in and want to get more, um, as I mentioned, I go through this pipeline. I go through an example business case of this entire pipeline uh, in my book, From Zero to Neural Nets in 60 ish ish pages. Uh, that's a tongue twister. Um, but you can find that uh, resource available to you at fastdatascience.ai. Um, again, thanks for watching. If you have any questions or comments, feel free uh, to include those as a part of this video. Um, or um, if, if you like the content that, uh, that you see here, uh, make sure to subscribe. Uh, I'm looking forward to doing a lot more of these sort of substantive oriented conversations um, and always making all of the material that I provide relevant to the bigger picture, to the understanding the bigger picture and how our efforts and skills really apply to that, that enterprise facing uh, uh, scenario so that we have as big impact as a big of impact as we can. So once again, thanks. And uh, I hope you all have a wonderful day and I will be talking with you soon. Bye everybody.